Like every movie needs a camera to record the actions, animation needs a camera to record the animation. Today I want to dive into everything you need to know about the Blender camera. The Blender camera is one of those tools you need to create an animation. Without a camera in Blender, we cannot render a scene. First things first, how do we add a camera? Press Shift and A, go down the drop down list and find camera. And there you have your camera object. To go into camera view or look through your camera, you have to use the short key Ctrl and 0 on your numpad. There you go. Hit it one more time to go out of it. Or you can just rotate the view. You could also go to view, viewpoint, camera. If we have multiple cameras in one scene, press Shift D to duplicate, rotate it quite a bit. We want to be able to switch between these two. I'll bring up the timeline and create a marker using M or use add marker under the marker menu. Go forward in the timeline, say frame 40, make another marker, and then we can press Ctrl B to bind the camera to our second marker. Go to the first marker, select the other camera, and say Ctrl B, and now the first camera is bound to the first marker. Let's create an object to view this. So let's create a icosphere, place it in the viewpoint of this camera, hit the play button, and when it hits 40, we switch cameras. We cannot get it in view for both, so let's, with my camera selected, I can use the channels right in the item menu on the, on the right side here. I can adjust the location, I can adjust the rotation or the scale. I could also use, like every object, G to move, R to rotate, and S to scale. I rotate the camera like this, and now it is in frame. So those were the basics, let me delete this scene. In this scene you can see I have more set pieces to fill up the scene. Also I already have a camera set up. If we select this camera, either in the outliner or in the viewport, we can go down on the right hand side to the camera settings. Let's close up everything we don't need and start with the lens settings. The first thing we notice is that this camera is set to perspective. Perspective is how we see the world around us. Object in the distance will appear smaller than objects in the foreground. And parallel lines, such as the roads or buildings, will appear to converge as they get farther away in any direction. In our perspective camera, we have multiple settings. For example, the focal length. The focal length is the distance between the lens and the sensor. Changing the focal length will create a zoom in or a zoom out, like scrolling the focus ring on a DSLR camera. Let's reset this to 50 millimeters. As you can see, the lens setting is set to millimeters. You can also choose the field of view, which is a setting in degrees. DSLR cameras, or rather most cameras, use a millimeter setting. So we artists usually stick to this as well. These settings, the sh these settings, shift X and Y, I never touched in the seven years I'm using Blender. Clip start and end are pretty handy to know. If something is close to the camera that you want to include or exclude from the shot, tweak the clip start. On the other hand, tweak the clip end to get a far away object included or excluded from the shot. On the camera type, we can switch from perspective to orthographic. With orthographic, perspective objects always appear at their actual size, regardless of the distance. This means that parallel lines appear parallel and do not converge as they do in perspective. Really, the only thing you should know about orthographic view that is different from perspective is this orthographic scale. Since there is no focal length in the orthographic view, we should use the orthographic scale to get some cropping effect. This is similar to a zoom. Last but not least, we can switch from orthographic view to panoramic, which can mean a photo up to 360 degrees around. For example, I use this to recreate my student dorm back when I was studying 3D animation. For example, for my 360 video, I use the equi rectangular. This panoramic type is probably one of the most common. 
you might recognize this from seeing an HDRI image. The panoramic type equisolid is one of the fisheye types. These lenses typically have a lot of distortion and are wide-angle lenses. The fisheye equidistant is another panoramic type. However, this doesn't match a physical lens. The mirror ball used to be a technique to capture the environment on a film set. In your world settings you can find, you can switch from equi-rectangular to mirror ball as well. Last but not least, we have a fisheye lens polynomial, which to be honest is quite advanced and goes over my head as well. The thing I want to say is that this can be used to model both fisheye and perspective lenses. So basically this can be used to model a specific custom camera for your shot. Let's move on to the next setting and unfold camera. Under camera, we can find a sensor fit, which is set to auto and a size, which is set to 36 millimeters. These settings adjust properties that relate to a physical camera body. By default, Blender calculates a square sensor size. If we switch from auto to horizontal, the default is set to a sensor size of 36 millimeters by 24 millimeters, which matches with a full frame sensor, also known as a 35 millimeter. Click the list icon to find several presets that are available to match existing cameras. For example, I like to choose full frame. By changing these settings, you indirectly influence the field of view. Where we earlier looked to change the focal length to do this. Adjusting the focal length is the preferred method in most cases. Unless your goal is to match a camera in Blender to a physical camera and lens combination. If we move on to the safe areas, we can tick this checkbox, which will display the safe area. For so long ago, TVs used to be squared. The screens use CRT, aka cathode ray tube, to display an image. With a variety of brands came different in manufacturing, which could ultimately lead to cropped images on screen. To combat that, safe guides, areas, or margins were invented. Unfortunately, most HD or 4K TVs still have overscan, which results in the edges of your image being cropped. Also, not all phones are actually 60x9 either. And that's why you should consider title saves and action saves. You can check them right here. You can put a background image into your camera view. This can be very helpful in numerous situations. Some people use it for modeling, others for animation references, or if you want to mix and match live action footage with 3D renders. It can be a great tool as well. You have the option to play movie formats as well. Press add image, browse to your image, make sure you take the checkbox, and then you can fine tune with the opacity, set the depth to in front or back. You can either stretch, fit or crop the image. Adjust the offset on the x-axis or the y-axis. Change the rotation of the image. Scale the image if you like. Flip the image either on the x or the y-axis or maybe both. Of course I don't want this overlay so let me just click the x right here. And for good measure, I uncheck this as well. Viewport display. Let's start with the first setting, which is size. From the camera view, you probably won't see anything happen if I change the size. If I go into my viewport, like so, I can change the size and this will change the size of my camera. This only changes the display of the camera. You could also change the scale setting right here which basically does the same. The next options are checkboxes, which will display a variety of overlays, starting with limits. Tick the limits checkbox to visualize the focus distance. This shows up as a cross in your viewport. Also, the clipping start and end values are displayed as white lines ending in a small dot. The mist checkbox enables the visualization of the start and end value of your mist pass. Enable the mist layer in the layer tab. Then you can adjust those values in the world tab. The next thing on the list is the sensor. This checkbox enables an overlay in the camera view. A full frame sensor which has a 3 by 2 ratio is getting cropped to 16 by 9 dimensions. You can visualize that by ticking the checkbox right here. Tick this name checkbox if you want your active camera view to display the name of your set camera which in most cases is camera. The pass per two feature might be one of my favorites. 
It allows you to block out the surrounding scene and lets you focus on everything in camera. Or the other way around. Say you want to animate something coming in the camera, you might want to check the timing and spacing when it's about to come into frame. In that case, bring down the pass per tool value. Depth of field is probably one of the more exciting and practical features for most of you. The distance determines the point that lies in pure focus. Everything before and after that point becomes blurry. To showcase this, I will enable my limits, like we've seen before. If I change the distance, you can see this cross moving along the path. The focus object will let you choose an object to determine the focal distance. Changing the f-stop allows you to control the amount of blur for the back and foreground. Having a low f-stop is also known as a shallow depth of field. Having a larger f-stop is also known as a deep or large depth of field. Now we come to blades. This setting has eluded me for so long, and I'm glad I know it, because it can create quite an awesome effect. A shallow depth of field can create something called a bokeh. By setting the blades to three, we can create a triangular bokeh effect. From tree up, the quote unquote subdivisions will increase and the bokeh will become more circular from then on. The rotation kind of speaks for itself, but hey, has a degree setting that will rotate your bokeh accordingly. Of course, when it's just a perfect circle, this is harder to see. When it is a triangle, a hexagon, or an octagon, you can see the rotation more clearly. Last but not least, the ratio changes the offset horizontally or vertically of your bokeh. This is a distortion effect on top of your bokeh. A setting of zero, a setting of one shows no distortion. Then a number below one will cause a horizontal distortion. And maybe you already guessed it, a number higher than one will cause a vertical distortion. Now, you know everything you need to set up your camera. In this video, I'll show you how to easily get butter smooth camera animations. I hope you learned something from this video. If you did, leave a like, comment down below if you have any questions. And as always, stay creative. I'll see you next time. Ciao.